With us this evening is David Meltzer from the American Red Cross headquarters in Washington, D.C. He will talk specifically on Haitian relief and recovery efforts tonight. But as we knew, know from the sad news coming out of Japan, many areas of the world need help from the American Red Cross and other relief organizations. They're ready to go and ready to help all over the world. I'm sure Mr. Meltzer will be happy to update us on Japan and these other areas during the Q&A portion of our evening, if you ask him. We know how busy you've been during the past week with the catastrophe in Japan, so we're very appreciative that you're here with us this evening. Um, so if you'll join me in welcoming Mr. David Meltzer from the American Red Cross. Thank you very much, and I think the sound is, is excellent, and I want to really extend my words of appreciation for all of you taking time out of your busy days and also for uh, the generosity of the World Affairs Council and all the supporters um, who've made this evening possible. Um, I would like to, I guess, start because I know there is a lot of interest um, around Japan and also give you a little insight into how things actually work when a disaster strikes. And, and Japan is uh, certainly the most recent example. Um, uh, literally, our CEO, Gail McGovern, received a phone call from the White House at about four in the morning on Friday in Washington time uh, from a senior member of the administration uh, saying that we're about to wake President ba Obama up and we want in three hours a briefing from the American Red Cross what it will do uh, in response to the earthquake and the follow-on tsunami. And of course, this was before we knew whether or not it would have significant consequences in countries outside of Japan, and including uh, the United States, Hawaii, and the West Coast. Um, very shortly after that, I became aware of the, uh, the, the disaster. I think it's kind of cool that um, uh, the American Red Cross learned of it before the President of the United States, but that's, um, <laughs> that's how sometimes a disaster works. And, and you, you often go, um, you know, you could be watching uh, television at home, you could be waking up in the morning and flip on the TV, but much like we see in the movies how you know, governments learn of things through CNN, that's often how we learn of things. This was a little unusual in that we got a call from the White House. Um, I want to start talking about Japan and Haiti. And certainly in, when we get to questions, I'm very happy to answer questions about Japan. But um, there are some similarities, obviously, b beyond the fact that we're dealing with an earthquake in Japan, but you have the added complication of a tsunami. But you'll see, as I walk you through this uh, table, um, the differences are more significant, and that has long-term consequences for the relief effort and long-term consequences for the recovery effort in Japan compared to um, uh, Haiti. The number one issue following a cataclysmic disaster such as an earthquake, and it's multiplied with a tsunami, is accessing the people in need. Japan has lots of resources. Um, Haiti, far, far fewer, and I'll talk about that. But how do you get relief supplies, life-saving relief supplies, to hundreds of thousands of people who literally lost everything except the shirts on their back? How do you get it to people in need when roads are destroyed, bridges are destroyed, railroads, rail lines are destroyed. This is a simple question of logistics. And very often, and we saw it in Haiti and we see it uh, unfolding before our eyes in Japan, military forces, they have logistics capacity, they can move a lot of uh, equipment and relief supplies rapidly. And they have helicopters, which very often, and is the case um, in Japan, is the only way to access when the roads are out and the bridges are out and the railway, rail lines are out. And so you see a lot of relief supply ferried via helicopter. Well, helicopters can't carry a whole lot. Um, all this is to say that in Haiti and in Japan, uh, the issue is getting life-saving relief supplies to people in the critical 48, 72-hour period. You need to provide food, water, and shelter, particularly in Japan because it's winter time. You also need, and I believe this is a biological need, um, you need to quickly enable people to learn what happened to their missing loved ones. 
And I've seen it play out in a number of disasters, Haiti, certainly now in Japan, and even in our own country in Katrina, where a million people were evacuated in the largest displacement of Americans since the Great Depression. And what happened in Katrina was we had whole families separated, put onto buses or airplanes, and went into literally different states of the Union, and people lost track of their children, their spouses, their parents. And uh, what is, I think, almost as important as food, water, and shelter is enabling people to restore the links with their family, restoring family links. And that is also going on in Japan now. In fact, if you were to go to the American Red Cross website, redcross.org, you'd see on the front page a list of web addresses and phone numbers for people who are looking for loved ones in Japan. It could be for Americans, looking for other Americans. There the phone number you call is the State Department. Or it could be Japanese uh, citizens in the United States looking for their fellow countrymen. There are means, and technology is wonderful, to help reunite uh, uh, people. But access is clearly a similar issue in Japan as it, as it was in Haiti. Another difference, and this impacts your disaster response, is the uh, area. In Japan, we're dealing with a very large area, hundreds of kilometers, square kilometers, uh, which means that you have to visit a lot of land. It takes a while, particularly, as I said, when the roads are down. The situation in Haiti was the disaster was a lot more localized into what I'll call Greater Port-au-Prince. Um, so once you got there, yeah, you still had access issues, but at least you were in the general vicinity, and, and very often people in need could walk to your relief station, I even if you could not bring the truck up through the impassable roads to get to this where the community had settled after losing their homes and everything else. So the geography can actually impact how your disaster response goes. And in, in Japan, as I said, we're challenged by the wide, wide area impacted. Environment. Haiti, Port-au-Prince, uh, obviously a city, uh, the largest city in Haiti, population pre-quake, about three million people. Um, very hilly, uh, it's kind of uh, C-shaped, and the open end of the sea is the ocean, and very hilly. And so you have a lot of people, three million people, crammed into a hilly area that I've been told, and I can't independently verify it, but it's a city that can comfortably accommodate about 600,000 people, and it had three million people, so very dense. Um, as I said, hilly, and what that means is a lot of narrow roads, uh, very difficult for heavy equipment to get up there, um, and consequently a lot of rubble, and its heavy equipment has difficulty to remove the rubble. In Japan, we're seeing a mixed bag. Uh, there is a city of modestly about a million people, I understand. Um, the nature of a tsunami, um, it wipes everything away. You know, you'll see where the wave will leave, at its height, the wave will leave rubble. And behind the wave, closer to the ocean, as I saw when I went to Indonesia and Sri Lanka following the tsunami there in 2004, um, it's not quite bare grass, but there isn't a whole lot of rubble. There isn't a whole lot of there, there um, following a tsunami. So we see a different urban landscape with a tsunami than we do with a simple earthquake. And then, of course, it's not just one or two cities or villages, it's also a countryside. And that, in a way, makes it easier. You have more widely dispersed populations, which means it tends to keep the death count down. But widely dispersed populations means it's more difficult to set up aid stations. You need more aid stations to get closer to the people. Because again, how are they going to get aid? They can walk but there are limits to how far they can walk. So the geography of the zone, the disaster zone, also impacts relief. Government effectiveness. Um, a lot has been written about the government of Haiti before the quake. Uh, certainly uh, was a very, very challenged government before the quake, a lot of it political instability. Um, the two former presidents alive um, were both in exile at that time. Uh, when the quake struck. Um, not a very strong government, not a strong tax base. The government obviously lives in the capital city, Port-au-Prince. The earthquake demolished the political capital and the financial capital of Haiti. 
when the, gov when the earthquake struck, it was roughly 4.30 in the afternoon on a work day. And what that meant in practical terms was that the best and the brightest and the most committed of civil servants were at their desks when the quake struck. And we've all seen the pictures of the presidential palace in shambles. What you don't necessarily see is that 25 of the 27 government buildings were demolished. So what that means is disproportionately civil servants, and again the most committed, hardworking civil servants, lost their lives. And in Haiti, the estimate is anywhere from 20 to 30 percent of the government employees lost their lives on January 12, 2010. What does that do to a weak government? Well, it makes it terribly, terribly weak. And I dare say if a cataclysmic event struck combined Washington, New York, our political and our financial capital, um, you would see this country brought to its knees too. And we have a strong government. Japan, a very strong government, very effective, a lot of resources, human resources, material resources, we see it on video. The Japanese self-defense forces, uh, essentially their military, um, has brought in over 100,000 soldiers into the disaster zone. Haiti, there is no military. They have a very small, ineffective police force. The UN is essentially the substitute. And what we saw in Haiti after the earthquake was US military forces essentially took over the airport, took over uh, the hospital, which was a staging ground for a lot of medical care in the early days uh, following the quake. In the case of Japan, you don't need that type of foreign assistance. They are there, they are strong, and again, the quake and the following tsunami did not strike the political capital, did not strike the financial capital of Japan, which left the Japanese government in a far, far better position to respond to the needs of its citizens than the government of Haiti following uh, their terrible quake. Material resources, again, I, I spoke earlier, you have the military logistics uh, capacity is really critical. Uh, you cannot compare a first world country like Japan with a third world country like Haiti. Um, far, far more resources, far richer um, d uh, number of resources at the disposal of the government of Japan. Health risks. Um, when the quake struck in Port-au-Prince, you had, in a matter of minutes, 1.5 million people rendered homeless. And in other presentations, I've tried to analogize it to a situation in the United States. Um, we all know New York City, uh, the borough of Manhattan, is an island. Manhattan has about 1.5 million people who live in Manhattan. I'm not talking about people who commute to Manhattan, but the people who live in Manhattan totals about 1.5 million people. And overnight, with that quake, 300,000 people left the city to go live with relatives in the countryside, leaving 1.2 million people in desperate search for shelter. And Port-au-Prince, as many cities in the developing world, uh, does not have a whole lot of open space. Not a whole lot of green space in Port-au-Prince before the quake. So you can go there in the early days, as I did following the quake, and you would almost, every open space would be covered by shelters, people living in shelters. And you may have seen on TV, there is um, one community that lives on the median strip of a road. Um, dangerous uh, beyond belief. That's how precious land is, and that's the situation uh, that you had 1.2 million people living cheek to jowl uh, without any real proper sanitation. There was none before the quake. Um, but you have people living in close quarters with poor sanitation, poor access to health care. And we all know that is a recipe for uh, epidemic. And it was not a healthy population, malnourished. Many people malnourished in, in, in Haiti before the quake. Japan, we don't have that to worry about. Most everyone will be fully vaccinated uh, through their child vaccination campaigns and uh, standard uh, visits to doctors. Doesn't happen in Haiti. Uh, many people will be living in sanitary conditions very rapidly. Didn't happen in Haiti. So the risk to, of mass diseases is significant um, in Haiti. And just a few words about cholera. 
So cholera has killed 4,000 people. Um, it has peaked. It's likely to have a resurgence when the rainy season starts in May. It's a waterborne disease. It's easily preventable, easily treatable. Cholera, and I'm paraphrasing the Centers for Disease Control, cholera in Haiti is not the result of an earthquake. Cholera in Haiti is a result of decades of neglect around sanitation systems. If you thought cholera was a result of the earthquake, you would have seen it either start in Port-au-Prince or actually do most of the damage in Port-au-Prince, and neither one happened. Cholera started in the countryside, and when it got to uh, Port-au-Prince, the uh, incident rate and the mortality rate was one-tenth of what it was in the countryside. At its height, cholera was claiming 10% of the 10% mortality rate in the countryside and less than 1% in Port-au-Prince. You can ask why, and, that's, and the answer is because a lot of humanitarian organizations like the American Red Cross invested in preparing communities for uh, um, communicable diseases. We and the World Health Organization funded a massive vaccination campaign uh, in the early weeks for over a million people. Um, you cannot, there's no real good vaccine against cholera. Um, so what we did, and other aid agencies to be sure, we trained hygiene promoters, we call them, Red, Red Cross volunteers, Haitians, on basic hygiene messaging. Go into the community and teach them basics, like wash your hands before you cook food. Things that we take for granted because we've had the proper education. Not the case in Haiti. So much different health risks. And finally, it all comes down to people. If you don't have educated people, you've got a long road ahead of you. And as I'll point out on the next slide, Haiti's literacy rate is slightly over 50%, meaning half the people can read and write. And within that half, and I think it's 54% can read and write, you get a broad range of capability. Trust me, there are, of that 54, a very small percentage are at what we would consider university level. So the, if you don't have the human resources, obviously your ability to recover is that much more challenged. And Japan and, and Haiti, um, it really is uh, quite, a, quite a startling difference. So let me talk about Haiti before the quake. And you know, there were all sorts of statistics, and I just threw up several of them, which hopefully give you an idea of what Haiti was like on January 11th, a day before the quake. Um, within here, there, there are probably a couple of statistics that, for me, stand out. Um, First one, 70% of all Haitians live on less than $2 a day. Less than $2 a day. And this is a country 700 miles away from Miami. And much of that $2 goes for the purchase of food, I mean, necessities. Um, you know, a, a challenge today, and many of you are familiar that the, the price of staples around the world has increased. I was just reading a UN report that the price of rice has increased uh, by about 50% in the last 12 months in Haiti. What does that do to your purchasing power when you're living on $2 a day or less? Another statistic I think that captures the challenges of Haiti is on the, uh, the right-hand side. 96% of Haiti is deforested. What that means in practical terms, as we now are in uh, recovery, is everything wood-based has to be imported. It also means that you have a population that is so poor they're chopping down their trees to make charcoal, which is what they can use to cook. Um, the level of environmental degradation is um, like none I've ever seen. As you fly over the island of Hispaniola from the DR to uh, Haiti, you can literally see where the border is from 30,000 feet. It really is startling. And you. And the consequences of environmental degradation just multiply. And so all of this meant, along with the Human Development Index, and we all know Haiti is the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere, um, the fact that there was no uh, adequate access for the vast majority of the population to sanitation. Only one third of Port-au-Prince had access to clean drinking water municipally provided prior to the quake. I mean, all these numbers tend to blur. 
Um, for those of you who have traveled extensively in the world, as I have, the level of poverty in Haiti is like none that I've seen with the exception of a few African countries. It really is startling, and this was Haiti before its political capital, before its financial capital was destroyed. So um, these are numbers, and, and who knows, and we'll never know, and the same thing can be said of any disaster, how many people lost their lives. The um, latest estimate, 310,000. It's a, you can't get your, your head around it. Um, the amount of rubble, um, I'll, I'll talk about the challenges of rubble removal in, in, a, in a few minutes, but um, I looked up a statistic just to kind of uh, make it real for, for, for you all. Um, if you filled a shipping container with rubble, uh, there's enough rubble there to put, I don't know how many thousands of shipping containers, but they would stretch from Grand Rapids to El Salvador in Central America. That's how much rubble was created when this quake struck a little over a year ago. And when I talk about rubble, I'll explain why one year later the vast majority of the rubble is still there. And realize, of course, you cannot build until you clear the rubble. That's uh, what I would call a gating item to recovery. Um, the other statistic, 50% of the buildings damaged or destroyed. It's roughly 20% destroyed, 30% damaged, and the other 50% undamaged. But of those 1.5 million people homeless, a good number of them, and I haven't seen a figure, but probably several hundred thousand, their homes were not damaged at all. They didn't have to live underneath a tarp. Why did they? Two reasons. One is psychological trauma. Um, aftershocks continued for weeks on end, and just we can't fathom, unless we have been through it, and I have not, um, the psychological impact of losing everything. Even if your home's still standing, you've lost family members, you've lost friends, you've lost your job, you've lost your social safety network, you've lost your anchor in life. The other reason many people with perfectly safe homes did not move back is, and again, this is the conundrum of aid. We deliver aid. We're handing out relief supplies. We're providing water for free. We're providing, in some cases, free uh, health care to people in the camps. So on the one hand, I've got, let's say I've got a home, and I've got a tarp over here, but in the tarp I can get free water, I can get free health care, I can get food in the early days. Uh, the early months, food was freely available from aid agencies, such as the American Red Cross. Where should I live? And these are tough decisions that many people uh, took by living underneath tarps. And when the aid starts ending, as all aid does, as money dries up, the magnet that aid often be is dissipates. And so we saw from a height of 1.3 million people living in these uh, tarp communities, uh, now there are about 800,000 people uh, left in the tarp communities. So I've spoken about a few of the challenges um, to Haiti's recovery, um, and none uh, steps out for me uh, more strongly than government capacity. A strong government can lead the way for recovery. Conversely, a weak government um, will not. I spoke earlier of Haiti, the government of Haiti's condition before the quake and the fact that it lost 20 to 30 percent of its best and brightest as a result of the quake. You know, I would challenge our government to respond effectively if we lost 20 to 30 percent of our workforce in an instant. So, this is a real, real uh, significant challenge. Human development. You know, we can talk about literacy, uh, we can talk about human capacity, um, but if you don't have people who are able to take the lead and effectively help their neighbors, um, you are going to have a very long road to recovery. Coordination. Um, a lot was written um, and continues to be written about the challenges of coordination in Haiti. Haiti has been called rather uh, negatively uh, the Republic of NGO. Uh, best estimate is uh, something like 10,000 NGOs operated in Haiti at the time of the quake. The vast majority of them, very, very small. 
In fact, um, the, if you will, the trade association for international NGOs called Interaction, they uh, published a, uh, a study and what it concluded was that 90% of the humanitarian relief assistance post-quake in Haiti, 90% is provided by 15 organizations, American Red Cross, one of them. So think about, of the 10,000 or so, 90% came from 15 organizations. How do you get 10,000 actors to coordinate? Uh, I'll speak for the American Red Cross, Catholic Relief, uh, Save the Children, uh, World Vision, the major international relief agencies. We know disaster. And I'm not exaggerating when I say there is a science to disaster relief. The other 9,900 very good, very well-intentioned, I'm absolutely not questioning motives, of the small NGOs doing wonderful work in the development sector, not the disaster relief sector, in development, which takes a whole different set of skills, doing really good work with a clinic, an orphanage, a school. Overnight, they were thrust into the relief world. And they don't have tons of people like the large NGOs, like the American Red Cross. And what coordination takes is human resources, people, to sit in a very hot, uncomfortable tent for hours on end to learn, for example, oh, save the children, you're distributing relief supplies to this community, um, Quad de Pre. Okay, so the American Red Cross, you've got that community covered, we're gonna go to Tabares. We're gonna go to a different community. You literally have to have people around the table, and that's what is done in what's called the UN cluster system. So the World Health Organization, for example, they will lead quarterback, if you will, the health sector cluster. Well, if you're a small NGO and you only have three or four people, and literally the school has just crumbled around you, you're gonna focus your relief efforts on the school children and their families and the extended families in your particular community. You don't have the time, you don't have the resources, you don't have the energy to send one of your few people down to some tent and disappear for eight hours to coordinate. So coordination ordinarily is a challenge in a disaster. Like the military talks about the fog of war, we talk about the fog of disaster. But what happened in Haiti was with all the very small NGOs that were not blessed with the resources that we are, coordination became a much bigger problem. And it continues to be a problem because there are so many NGOs in Haiti. Urban environment, I mentioned some of the challenges, um, you know, the, uh, the, the inaccessible roads, uh, the many, many people uh, living in close quarters. Um, uh, it really uh, speaks to a whole different ball game when you're talking about relief and recovery. I don't know if I mentioned earlier, but Haiti, uh, the earthquake in Port-au-Prince is the single largest urban disaster in the entire world since the end of World War II. Think about that. In all the years since the war ended in 45, there's been no disaster bigger in, a, in an urban environment and Port-au-Prince, and the unique challenges that presents. Land tenure, um, it's a fancy word for trying to figure out who owns the land. Um, much like uh, the, the rest of the developing world, there aren't really a whole lot of land records uh, in Haiti pre-quake, and there were even fewer post-quake. Remember I told you, 25 of 27 government buildings destroyed, and a lot of those buildings had land records, they're gone. How do you prove land ownership? And just to see how it relates to rubble removal, I'll walk you through why we see so much rubble uh, 14 months after the quake. So if I want to remove rubble, I can't go on the land unless I find the landowner. Otherwise, I'm going to have five or ten people coming at me saying, oh, you want to remove land, uh, rubble from that land? You've got to pay me. That's my land. That's the way the world works. So we've got to find the owner. Again, no land records. Now there is a way to do that. You bring the community together and the community decides who really owned the land. It takes time. Let's say you figure out who the landowner is. Now you got to remove the rubble. Well, much of Port-au-Prince is very hilly, as I said, really steep hills, very narrow hills, and much of it is inaccessible to heavy equipment. With all the rubble that's been removed, and you can see the progress, um, the majority of it's been removed by pickaxe, wheelbarrow, and hand. I kid you not. Let's say you actually get rights to the land, 
You got your wheelbarrow, you're ready to go, and here's the next challenge. In, uh, in Haitian culture, much like mine and probably yours, um, you don't want to work around dead bodies. And there are many bodies left in the rubble. Also in Haitian culture, many people believe if you disturb the remains of someone who has not been properly blessed and buried, you could bring bad fortune upon yourself, a curse if you will. So not impossible, but it is difficult to find people to work in the rubble. That's a challenge. Let's say you overcome all those challenges. You figured out who owns the land. You've gotten the equipment, or in some cases, wheelbarrows and pickaxes, onto the land to remove the rubble. And you found the workers willing to work among the, uh, uh, the deceased. Where do you put the rubble? Remember I told you how much rubble there is. Um, Haiti, before the quake, had one landfill. It's full now. So where do you put the rubble? None of these problems are insurmountable, but I think they give you a sense of what an urban disaster in Haiti uh, presents as a challenge. Political uncertainty, I talked earlier at the top of the list about a stable government. Unfortunately, Haiti doesn't have that. Um, we're days away from the runoff election for a president, the head of state. Uh, when they had the first round election back in December, um, there were widespread allegations, ultimately uh, established as true, of fraud. And people took to the streets when the results were announced of the first round, and there was widespread violence. And we as the American Red Cross, and I dare say most of the aid agencies, we had to stop providing life-saving care and support. We had to stop our fight against cholera for three or four days. You know, that is a real impact on our ability to help Haiti when people take to the streets. Right now, uh, former president or former exiled president uh, Duvalier, he's in Haiti. He's stirring the pot. Uh, the press reports are that another exiled former president, Aristide, will be returning to Haiti in the next 24 to 48 hours. The government of South Africa has said they've allowed him to leave. The government of Haiti has said we will allow him to come into the country and that will add yet another um, ingredient to the already uh, bubbling pot that is the Haiti political environment. Ongoing disasters. I mean, Haiti is really uh, prone to disasters. I talked about cholera. In November, a level one hurricane, uh, smallest level or lowest level, Hurricane Tomas, passed through Haiti. Um, I think it's a testimony to the disaster preparedness initiatives that we and other humanitarian organizations undertook in recognition of this real risk, in recognition that we had over a million people homeless living underneath tarps and extremely vulnerable to hurricanes, that we only saw the loss, tragic as it is, of a few dozen people from Hurricane Tomas. In 2008, Haiti was struck with four hurricanes. It will be struck again. Um, I'm not a seismologist, and as you all know, no one really knows when an earthquake will strike. But this is, what the seismologists do say is that the uh, fault zone that fired off a year ago was not the main fault zone that goes through Haiti. There's a bigger one somewhere in the future of Haiti. You have the risk of diseases and um, all sorts of other uh, almost biblical um, catastrophes that unfortunately regularly visit Haiti. Um, so we know the future is going to impact relief and recovery efforts. These are all very real challenges uh, that we face, and notwithstanding that, you know, we are doing some good. And I just want to take a, a few minutes to talk about what is the American Red Cross doing. And through the generosity of Americans like yourselves, we receive $480 million, by far more money than any other aid agency. So. Here's what we're doing. In the first 12 months, we spent about 245 million of that 480 million. A little over half of the money was spent. And we're focusing on what we call sectors, six sectors. And again, it's important that we stay within our lanes, that you know, we owe it to the people of Haiti and we owe it to our donors not to waste money, obviously. We know certain things well. We do certain things well. And I'm proud to say we do disaster preparedness well. So we focus on disaster preparedness. We know water well. Collectively, the, the Global Red Cross, and we're funding much of it, 
is bringing clean water to 316,000 people every single day in Port-au-Prince. And as you can see, we're building homes. We're working with partners like uh, Habitat for Humanity, Handicap International, in building, and you see the picture in front of you, what are called transitional shelters. These are not permanent homes. These are very modest one-room structures that are hurricane resistant, quake resistant, up to a certain point to be sure, but they are safe from the elements. They give people a sense of normalcy, certainly much better than a simple tarp that people have been living underneath. We will, with about a $100 million project, later this year breaking ground on uh, building new homes, both inside Port-au-Prince and immediately outside. Sanitation, uh, similarly, is an area of focus for us. Um, I could take you to Indonesia, Sri Lanka, Thailand, and the Maldives following the tsunami, and we, with partners, have built thousands of homes with indoor plumbing, for the first time in people's lives, indoor plumbing. It's our hope, it's our expectation, we'll do the same in Haiti. IHRC uh, membership, uh, that's the Interim Haiti Recovery Commission, uh, co-chaired by Haitian Prime Minister Bel Reeve and former U.S. President Clinton. The Red Cross is a member of that. Um, that does two things for us, frankly. Um, it allows us to bring the expertise that we have, decades of recovery work, tsunami being the most recent example, but you know, whether Hurricane Mitch in the 90s and, and other examples, the Red Cross has really done recovery work, which is more difficult than relief work. And the other thing is it, it gets us inside the tent, if you will. Um, it allows us to advocate directly with the Haitian Prime Minister, with President Clinton, with uh, the U.S. State Department, which is also around the table, not co-chairing, and um, make sure what we think are the, the needs of the most vulnerable, which is our mission, are clearly understood and articulated. Final, what we're focusing on is, because we don't do just bricks and mortar, is rebuilding the capacity of the Haitian Red Cross, the single largest civil society organization in Haiti before and after the quake. Before the quake, 10,000 volunteers. I don't know how many people were lost, but certainly they lost just like everyone else in Haiti. So, in conclusion, um, if there's one frustration I feel um, when I read the newspaper articles about how things are going in Haiti or see the television or just talk to um, ordinary citizens, it's the American expectation that if you throw money at it, the problem gets taken care of quickly. It does not. All you have to do is see how long it took Japan, again, a very rich, richly resourced country, following the Kobe earthquake in 1995, it took that country seven years to get that city to the point of where it was before the quake from a financial perspective. Seven years in a very rich country. Um, and there are all sorts of examples, including in our own country, where you can go to a disaster site and see how little has been done. Recovery is tough. It's much easier to distribute blankets and tarps than it is to rebuild something that took centuries to build. Port-au-Prince didn't spring up in a matter of years. It took decades and centuries to build it in the first place. Recovery is difficult. Um, hopefully, through the previous slides and what I've been saying, you, you have an appreciation of why Haiti is particularly challenging. Given the fact that it's urban, given the fact that it's a poor country, given the fact that its government is weak and was weakened considerably as a result of the earthquake, Haiti presents real challenges to the long-term recovery. Um, there are all sorts of studies which show political stability is a key driver to economic development. If you don't have stability, it's not to say it'll be impossible, it's much more difficult. So for us, Certain things we can control, certain things we cannot. We're not political. I'll take no position on who should be the president and whether it's good or bad that Aristide comes back if he comes back. But what I can say is, if that lends political or creates political instab instability, that is bad from a humanitarian perspective. It may be good for Haiti in the long term. I don't know, and I'll not hazard a guess. But from a humanitarian perspective, if it creates instability, it'll be bad. Um, final issue, American Red Cross, I said, had $480 million, a lot of money. More than half, as I said, was spent, and it's a drop in the bucket 
to what is really needed to make a lasting uh, change. American Red Cross, we, um, we can make a lot of good in long-term recovery for tens of thousands of people, but we deal in the millions, 480 of them in this case. Governments deal in the billions. At the UN Donor Conference in March of 2010, governments pledged, I think, over $10 billion. And so far, according to the United Nations, they have delivered about 60% of what they promised, 6-0, which some people tell me, I haven't studied it, is actually a pretty good record in terms of governments honoring pledges after disasters. If governments honor their full pledge, there are real prospects, I think, for Haiti, uh, and I'm not just talking about the tens of thousands that we will benefit long term, but hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions, and you will see, I think, a much stronger Haiti over the long term. Again, it doesn't happen overnight. If governments don't deliver, well, of course, Haiti is going to be that much more challenged. Um, you read reports where some uh, government officials are now questioning, given the political instability, should we honor our pledges? Should we take our taxpayer dollars and give them to a government which is unstable or allegedly corrupt? I'm not saying those aren't legitimate questions. I am saying that if the answer is no, hold on to your money, there are consequences for Haiti's recovery. I'm not saying it's a right decision. I'm just saying there, there are consequences. So um, in my mind, these are, I think, the key factors to, to keep in mind. So um, I want to thank you and also um, really encourage you, as I've said uh, earlier, is, uh, to, to ask questions. Now, you, you've all been billed as a really good audience that loves to ask questions. So. Um, the gauntlet has been thrown down, and, and now's the opportunity to, to ask questions. But thank you very much for your, your attention. So who's the first brave soul? Right here. IHRC was important because of the access that you get to people like former President Clinton and State Department. Isn't it really, like, isn't uh, that like kind of having two standards for Haiti, and, like a standard for Haiti and a standard for the United States in terms of politics? And I, I think that uh, uh, if you would comment on the historical relationship between the United States and Haiti politically and all the horrible things that our government has done to their government, especially in the last 20 years, um, okay. that seems like there's something there that needs to be discussed. Okay, um, so my comment about the benefits of being on the commission in that um, it gets us access to key decision makers. Um, you know, there, there is one person on the commission, and it's I think about 30 people at this point, who represents the NGO community, one person. Uh, Non-Haitian NGOs, and one person representing Haitian NGOs. Uh, Technically, the Red Cross is not an NGO, but let, let, let's consider ourselves an NGO. We now have three people who our whole mission is to represent uh, the most vulnerable. I think that brings a voice to these meetings that tend to get focused on what I'll call political and governmental issues, and that's why I think it's important for us, or really any NGO, to be in that tent. Um, in terms of commenting on U.S. government, Haitian government history, um, you, know, you can draw your own conclusions whether it's been good or bad for the country. Uh, certainly the U.S. government has a long history of intervention, and certainly if you talk to Haitians, there's a lot of distrust and dislike uh, towards the U.S. government as a result of those interventions. Um, that manifests itself in real ways. I mean, just to, just to use an example, there is a uh, widespread belief in Haiti that cholera was brought to the island by the United Nations. And there's actually some scientific evidence uh, to the effect that the strain of the, um, uh, the bacteria has actually been identified by scientists as an Asian strain, in, in particular Southeast Asian strain. 
And then another data point is that the, uh, the outbreak occurred in a river in Arta Benit uh, province, which is a rural province, and the ground zero, if you will, of the outbreak was at the foot of a hill, and at the top of the hill was a camp of um, uh, Nepalese peacekeepers, UN peacekeepers. So many people in Haiti have put the two and two together, and they come up with, that, you know, whether it's four or five, I don't know, there's an independent commission studying it, but many people believe the UN brought cholera. And so that mistrust that you see towards the UN and you also see it towards the US in many quarters manifests itself. It could be an innocuous way. Someone graffitied one of our Red Cross vehicles and said Red Cross equals cholera. You know, it creates a sense of mistrust. So interventions, whether they are right or wrong, in the political sense, it has a, a, a consequence from a humanitarian perspective. It creates mistrust, and we have to deal with that. 90% um, of the time, the benefit of the Red Cross is it is widely perceived, not just in this country, but in Haiti and the rest of the world, as independent and neutral and, and apolitical, um, which is why I'm not going to answer your question whether it's good or bad what the U.S. has done in Haiti. Um, that's a, that's a, a, a political judgment. Uh, what I will say is there are consequences even for the Red Cross when governments engage in behavior. Uh, so it's, uh, it's something we deal with, frankly, on a daily basis, and my team in, in Haiti um, in particular has to deal with it. Thank you. Next question? Yeah. Okay. Um, just about the difficulties um, taking care of them or moving it out, and I was wondering just how much of that could be salvaged for rebuilding and what resources would be needed to do that? Um, a lot of the rubble can be recycled. Um, for example, um, we piloted a, uh, a house, and I don't know that this will actually become widespread, but um, uh, for those of you with, with background in the development world or even engineering, it's called Gabion. Basically, you take rubble, you, um, you form it into blocks, you surround the blocks with chicken wire, and all of a sudden you've got a block, which then becomes part of a wall, which then becomes part of a house. It's a neat, interesting way to recycle rubble, and it's fairly stable. Um, you can also use rubble, and this I think has got greater application, uh, to create pavers, you know, for um, the pavement. Um, there, are, there are reuses of rubble that are good. There are uses of rubble that are not. Um, if you travel through Port-au-Prince, you will see uh, rebar, you know, the uh, iron rods, um, which are used to stabilize um, uh, concrete, which is really important if there's an earthquake. Um, you see rebar, bent, misshapen, being recycled. That's not good. I mean, this is weakened uh, steel. So um, some recycling is very constructive, other is not. But you know, if you're poor and you're trying to rebuild a house and you see some rebar, you're going to grab it. Um, you're not necessarily thinking about building back better. Your focus is building back. So uh, there are uses for rubble. Uh, some of them are good, some of them not so good. Thank you. Okay, and then we have, after that, someone here in the front row. So, yes, up here. Uh, hi. Um, you mentioned that the Red Cross has a desire to help rebuild um, infrastructure, and you mentioned that the house is going to go plumbing and sanitation for the sanitary. Um, but how do you plan to uh, continue funding this infrastructure? Like, is there a sustainable effort to uh, keep this infrastructure running in what is basically turning into a failed state? Very good question. Uh, so let me give you a couple of examples because I'm going to I'm going to um, challenge you because I don't think I said we'll do infrastructure. We'll do homes. We'll we'll build indoor plumbing. But someone's got to build the pipe to get to the house. If not, yeah, we could build homes where rainwater can be collected uh, and other low tech systems, but nowhere near as efficient as um, pipe. So someone's going to have to build that. And if not, as I said, there's a plan B. Um, how do we create, my words, uh, or avoid creating a culture of uh, dependency? Uh, and certainly many people, Paul Farmer, have written about how NGOs, uh, with the best of intentions, I believe, have created a failed state because everything is done for the government, for the people. Um, I'll give you an example. So I mentioned earlier that the Red Cross is trucking water for 316,000 people every day in Port-au-Prince. It's free water. And again, in Haiti, before the quake, people bought water. 
And so when I talked about aid being a magnet, here's an example. At some point, our money runs out. A couple of months ago, I saw something in the news, Oxfam UK has run out of money. They're stopping water distribution, which was one of the things they were doing in a number of the camps. Here's how we're planning on avoiding um, leaving the communities that we serve for water in the lurch. Um, two, two ways. First is when we provide water, uh, it's actually a pretty complicated system. You collect water at its source, you gotta treat it, you then gotta pump it into a truck. The truck has to be maintained in a clean manner. The truck needs to go to the community. The truck needs, with a hose, needs to uh, get the water from the truck into what's called a bladder, a rubberized uh, large container. You fill it with water. The bladder has um, taps or, or um, faucets, and people get water. When we are done, who's going to take that over? Um, actually, a, an element of the Haitian government is uh, called DINEPA. It's an acronym. I don't recall the French words. D-I-N-E-P-A. It's the Municipal Water Authority. And in relative terms, they're actually pretty strong. So we're working with them, training their personnel on how to maintain the system, including the trucks, and, and ensure that the system doesn't collapse when we leave. The other consequence of creating a culture of dependency is where people have gotten water for free for well over a year now, is how do you uh, wean them off of free water? And what we will be doing is um, gradually uh, charging people, gradually. So we're not going to just say, okay, we're done, uh, whatever the price is in local currency, you got to pay the full price. No, you gradually do that, uh, in, in, in impose a price. Um, you can do it in the form of water vouchers, so they've got the full price, but then they've got a voucher which covers, let's say, 75% of the price, and then three months, six months later, it's 50%, and so on and so forth. So there are ways uh, that don't create terrible upset to get people off of free assistance, and that is responsible. It's not responsible to just cut it off, and I'm not saying Oxfam did that, I, I just don't know, but it is, um, it is part of the, if you will, the exit strategy so that we leave Haiti, uh, hopefully, in, in better shape uh, than uh, when we got there. There was a question here in the front row. Uh, <clears throat> I was in uh, Haiti in 1951, uh, just called the Navy, just for, for a couple of days there. As I recall, <clears throat> in Port Prince, the poor people and all the shops and everything were down a water level almost lower part, and then there was the hills behind, and it looked like, my recollection is, the, the rich people lived up there in the hills of all the embassies and the foreigners. The question is, when this earthquake hit, um, and this is probably your geography of the situation, did it devastate the poor areas, or did it also go through a swath in the hills? And The, um, the rich always do better. I don't care what country, uh, including our own. Um, the neighborhood you're describing in the hills, uh, it's probably uh, Pechonville. And um, uh, the structures are more soundly built, and so they, they, uh, they suffered fewer consequences. But what did happen in the, um, over the years in Haiti, um, a lot of the hills that um, were uninhabited became inhabited by the poor. Um, the hills became denuded of uh, topsoil. Ultimately, the trees were burned for firewood. The topsoil washed away, and so you had people building their homes on bare rock. Well, in the quake, in the hilly zones, where there was no earth to dampen, if you will, uh, those homes just slid down. And I don't know if it was uh, in, if I used it in the presentation, but there's a picture of the, the hills surrounding what had been our office building, which we, we uh, occupied the ground, uh, a quarter of the ground floor of a two-story structure which had served as the headquarters of the Haitian Red Cross, and that was demolished. And the hillside, a very poor neighborhood, just gave way. Uh, so um, if you've ever been to Caracas, Venezuela, um, you see the hills surrounding the city, and you can have beautiful 
neighborhoods in Caracas, but the poor people are clinging to the sides of hills. And when you have floods or you have earthquakes, those neighborhoods, they disappear. And that's unfortunately what we saw in Haiti. Uh, the poor neighborhoods on the hills gave away. Yes, sir. Um, first, thing, thank you for coming to speak to us today. Sure. And secondly, I have a question about um, the situation in Japan, if you don't mind. No, I absolutely. Yes. All right. Um, as the current situation, as it's been reported, is that um, apart from the earthquake and the tsunami, there are uh, two uh, nuclear power stations in the areas that were hit by the tsunami, and as of now, the Japanese government is um, unable to accurately assess the situation for one, and that it may be some mass evacuation being sought. And there's a lot of worry that this could turn that there could be potential explosion for another uh, Turtle Royal or Three Mile Island uh, catastrophe. So my question is, is how does that current situation and the extreme location to that area affect your operations in Japan now? And if the worst were to happen, how uh, the Red Cross would respond to that kind of situation? Okay, so uh, the, the immediate impact is, I forget the number, two or 300,000 people have been moved out of what's essentially an exclusion zone, um, and it varies from one plant to the other, but 10 or 20 kilometers. Um, and so now we've got, you know, on top of all the homeless people as a consequence of the tsunami, as a consequence of the earthquake, you have people who have perfectly fine homes, but they've had to leave their homes because you now have an exclusion zone. So it's made relief operations more complicated because you have more people to take care of. Um, there are also undoubtedly people inside the exclusion zone that we're not allowed to access. So it does create complications. Of course, if the, uh, the worst case scenario uh, develops of a meltdown, well then you can expect a wider exclusion zone, more displacement. And um, you know, to the question of what the Red Cross is doing, um, I the Japanese Red Cross I mentioned at the beginning, th they maintain hospitals. Um, it's not something the American Red Cross does, but the Japanese Red Cross has, I think, 96 hospitals is what I had read. And they have doctors and nurses. Um, among their areas of specialty um, in Nagasaki, um, probably not for uh, coincidental reasons, uh, they maintain a, a team that is now on standby of physicians highly trained in decontamination and treating radiation poisoning. And so that team, as well as many others around the country, are on standby if the worst case happens, then they will treat people, I don't think they would be allowed into the zone, the hot zone, if you will, um, but they will treat people um, who are brought to aid stations. They're already treating people, not for radiation poisoning, but the many, many physical injuries that people have suffered as a, as a consequence of the uh, earthquake and then the, um, uh, the tsunami. Thank you. Um, in disaster, You've, you've highlighted a really, really difficult issue, what we call beneficiary selection. Um, first, how do you choose where to build? Um, go back to one of my early issues. You've got to get land rights. Um, real life example, um, we had been in discussions with the Inter-American Development Bank. They were buying land. They wanted us to build homes on the land, just outside of Port-au-Prince. And so we had an agreement to agree and uh, literally, the Inter-American Development Bank brought the heavy equipment to the land, and I'm told I wasn't there. I'm told that they actually fired up the engines of the heavy equipment, and some guy came out with a piece of paper and said, this is my land, what are you doing on it? And the Inter-American Development Bank, IDB, said, well, we got a piece of paper from the government saying that they had expropriated your land by eminent domain. And the landowner said, well, they didn't pay me enough. And if you don't get off my land, my private security force will take you off the land. And so that project is not going forward. <laughs> That's a real example. If you get the land, your next question is, how do you select who gets to live there? Again, you know, there are one, well, now there are about 800,000 people living underneath tarps. And there's, trust me, there's nowhere near enough land to build homes for 800,000 people in Port-au-Prince. 
If you want to move two hour drive north, plenty of land, plenty of land. But we know from experience people will not move if they feel that their, their livelihoods are not assured, jobs, and their family members and neighbors aren't going to be there. It's really difficult. Someone with far more experience in development said to me that in all the history of international development, there has never been a mass migration that hasn't occurred at the tip of a spear or a gun. So how do you incent people to leave their livelihoods, leave their family, leave their neighbor to move you know, two hours away? It's very, very difficult. And that means you gotta do it close in where land is at a premium. So the math doesn't add up. There's not enough land to house everyone in Port-au-Prince. And frankly, the government and good urban planning wants to what they call decentralize. It's not good to have your whole country or much of your country's economy built around one city. They want to create what they call poles, economic poles. One in the north, one in the south, one in the, uh, the east. The way you select beneficiaries, there are two ways. The first way, not the good way, is the government comes in and says, okay, these people will get these homes. Okay, um, and generally those tend to be the ones that are you know, aligned with the right political party or the ones that pay the most cash. Um, and what happens often is um, you build the home, that person moves in, you leave, and then the community says, uh uh uh, uh. you're out of here. We don't think you're the most deserving. The best way, in, in our view, is to engage the community in a conversation. You know, it's not me, the white guy coming from Washington, saying, okay, here are the criteria that you need to adopt. You need to privilege or uh, put first priority elderly. I may personally think that's the right approach, that the elderly get first, first crack at available housing. But if the community doesn't think so, as soon as I leave, they're gonna kick the elderly out and they're gonna put someone else in. What we can do and what we will do is offer the community leaders, and you can identify the community leaders, criteria. You, know, you ask them a series of questions. Who do you think is most deserving? Is it the elderly? Is it female-led households? Is it uh, male-led households with, uh, with income? Is it the unemployed? You develop criteria, and we know this from experience most recently in the tsunami-affected region, and you have a conversation and you get the community to buy in first to the criteria. And then the individuals are applied against the criteria by the community so that there is some assurance that when we leave, the community will respect the decision that the community took. And it's, it's a method that has proven time consuming but effective. And that's how you decide um, who gets to live there. And just a little side story with an urban disaster. Not that they have high rises, but you know, there were modest apartment buildings. And example, let's say it's a two-story, four-family apartment building that's destroyed. Well, if you're going to rebuild there and you're not going to rebuild an apartment building, there's only land for two families, not the four that lived there before. So again, who gets to decide to live there? What we advocate is let the community decide. We believe it's much more effective in the long term, even if it does take longer. Thank you. Okay, and then we have one way in the back over there. Okay, okay. I got a blind spot on my left. My apologies over here. And then we'll get to you. Yes? My question, fortunately, I know the question, but I think it's been asked before, but if we look at the island from a natural perspective, we've got prisons on one side and we've got the Dominican Republic on the other. And they're vastly different in terms of their economic status. I haven't read, but I have been informed that there are a number of arguments that 10,000 NGOs are perpetuating uh, tents and impossible uh, poverty situations. And these people will never change as long as the NGOs are there and are, are not just digging themselves out of their, out of their position. Mm -hmm. so on that. Yeah, and um, I think there's some truth to that. You know, it goes back to the question of how do you avoid creating a culture of dependency? It's not our objective. You know, we're gonna run out of money. Um, we had a very modest program before the earthquake of um, educating youth about prevention of HIV AIDS. 
Uh, we also had a program about preparing communities for disasters, for hurricanes, and you know, because they're obviously prone to hurricanes. I had 14 people. Um, it's not like the American Red Cross was receiving tens of millions of dollars from the American people to program in Haiti. There are many, those 10,000 NGOs, they're there. Um, it takes responsible programming. It takes engaging the local population in the programming. It will not succeed, in my view, if all the decisions are made by some uh, expat uh, from Washington or some other country outside of Haiti. You have to engage the community. Um, otherwise, you are creating that culture of dependency. Um, interesting thing you mentioned about the DR, and I've only been told this, so take it with a grain of salt, that the GDP and per capita GDP of Haiti about 50 years ago was far ahead of the Dominican Republic, and it's flipped in 50 years. And when, I, when I've asked the question, why, you know, what, what decisions things the DR associates here in Grand Rapids, and so I was able to be in Haiti last February 20th or 27th. And comment on the distrust. I want to comment on my experience with the people, the local people. There was no distrust there. There was only respect and admiration for the people coming to give them a hand. So now that wasn't in the city proper. That was outside the city. And, and we were taken to the community, into the, our translators took us to the homes, and, and just the reception we received was outstanding. So we didn't sense that, that distrust in that community that we were in. The real question I have, and it kind of touches on the point you just made, is that what is being done from an educational standpoint for the people of Haiti? I mean, we really, the real crux of growth comes in the education and the release of the power of the individual, which is often stunted by the governments that, as you see around the world. So I was wondering if you could comment, does the Red Cross have any impact in education and, and things of that nature? Okay. Um, just on the mistrust issue, um, I would say it's more prevalent in the city. Um, I would say that the early days it was really not there. Um, with the introduction of cholera, we've seen mistrust and we've seen crime. Um, it's not related to cholera per se, but there's a lot more crime than there was in the early days. And unfortunately, a lot of the crime is um, targeted against people who work for NGOs because they are perceived as having money. You know, it's not necessarily anti-NGO, uh, but certainly more crimes being committed against NGO workers. And how do you know who an NGO worker is? He or she, and even if they're Haitian, they're the ones wearing the NGO t-shirt. Um, so we've actually had to tell, because of the spike, we've had to tell our workforce, and we have hundreds of Haitians working for us in our programs, um, we can't tell them, we have to ask them, and strongly suggest, don't wear your American Red Cross shirt when you're off duty. It can make you a target. Um, education. When I listed what the American Red Cross is doing, you didn't see education listed. We don't know it. We don't do it well. There are other Red Cross societies, I think the Danish Red Cross, that are building schools. Um, so, 
education is a focus for some Red Cross societies, certainly um, organizations like UNICEF say to children, they're building schools, they're trying to emphasize uh, education. We are, if you will, dabbling in education. Um, and it's a sad testimony uh, to the Asian education system that I think the figure is 90% of all Asian children in school are in private schools. That's because the public school system largely does not exist. And you know, when I call a private school, it's not like you and I picture a private school. Um, when I was last down here three weeks ago, I visited a program where um, we're paying for the private school education for children. And I went to one of the schools. It's considered among the best private schools in Port-au-Prince. Um, it was a large room. Each classroom had 60 kids. That was the average. One teacher. Um, on blackboard, uh, a roof open on the sides, and um, the kids had uh, books, workbooks, uh, that looked really old and very tattered and very worn. And that's education uh, today in one of the best private schools. Um, so to your point, we know education is a, is a, is a building block for uh, economic development. Um, it's not our strength to be honest, as the American Red Cross. And you know, we have a responsibility to the people of Haiti and, the, and our donors not to waste money where we don't know how to, how to spend it well. So um, we look to other organizations to focus on education, which you're right, is certainly a building block. We have time for two more questions. Yes, good evening, Mr. Mills, sir. I'm Rafael. Hi. And I'm with the local American Red Cross, and we'll welcome you. Um, my question has to do with the health. I believe that you mentioned that 84,000 died of cholera, or some number, but that was not due to the devastation that we currently, that they currently are experiencing there. What kind of health problems are you seeing in the, in, there at this time? Uh, those that are in the refurbished or you know, reconstructed housing areas, and those that are not. And you know what resources are there other than American Red Cross to address those issues? And secondly, you mentioned that there is no police force there. Am I correct? No, okay. there, there is. It's, it's a very modest and not terribly effective. Not, okay. Is there strategies to address that so that law and order can be brought to the area? Thank you. Sure. And um, in the health sector, um, and American Red Cross, we're currently supporting. Um, well, it used to be three, now two hospitals. One was a field hospital set up by the German Red Cross during the emergency phase. They recently closed, but to the earlier question of how do you assure uh, sustainability, uh, the German Red Cross, they trained Ministry of Health people, they gave them equipment, and our hope and belief is that uh, the German Red Cross um, facility is, is currently being used. Um, we're also supporting Haiti's largest public hospital, University Hospital or HUE is, is the French acronym, H-U-E-H. Uh, we're funding Partners in Health, uh, Paul Palmer's group that some of you know, um, to pay salary supplements to the entire staff of HUE um, because their wages paid for by the government are far below what they can get working for other medical institutions. So it's a way of avoiding or mitigating brain drain, if you will, out of uh, HUE. And it's, it's also a way of to your other question, building capacity um, in the Haitian government. These are ultimately employees of the Haitian government. We're also supporting um, the only critical care facility in all of Haiti, it's the Nard Med Hospital, and that's being run by a US NGO in partnership with the University of Miami called Project Medicia. What, what I have seen and what I've heard in terms of what are the health issues um, in Port-au-Prince, um, health issue of the sort that is increasing the most is um, violence, um, whether it's gunshots or um, assaults, um, there's a increasing violence. A lot of it is violence directed against women, um, has terrible conditions, not a whole lot of security. Um, gangs were a problem before the quake, not as big a problem as they had been several years earlier. Uh, UN Minusha, the UN peacekeepers, had done a very good job of bringing uh, a very good degree of law and order to Port-au-Prince. 
uh, has slipped a bit since the quake, and really since in the last six months. Um, I've seen the statistics, and certainly there is an uptick in violence, and that is uh, probably a significant health issue. Um, malnutrition was an issue before, it continues to be an issue, um, and with malnutrition, certainly all sorts of health issues, including stunted uh, mental development, um, which is health, even if it doesn't manifest itself uh, so, so easily. So those are the, uh, the health issues, and I've now forgotten your second question, so. Quickly. Law and order. Law and order. Okay, so um, there have been efforts uh, in the past to train uh, police force. Uh, sometimes those have failed because the right people aren't selected. Sometimes they tend to be allies of the political party uh, who are in the police force. Um, sometimes, you know, the challenge is you don't have a tax base if you're the government. So how are you going to pay your specifically municipal employees. Um, you know, there's a challenge for all governments in the developing world, where do you get the money to pay your employees? And if you can't pay them, then you probably don't keep them. And so you have a constant turnover. Um, there, are, there have been programs, I think uh, the US government, uh, through USAID, has had a program uh, post-quake uh, for training police uh, policemen. You see them around. Um, I won't say they're ineffective, there just aren't enough of them. And there are certain areas that even they don't go into. So I guess we're up to our last question. Where was that? Eric, okay. How much of the reconstruction in Haiti is being done by Haitians, and is it being used as a method of teaching the building trades to Haitians so they can be employed rebuilding their own country? The vast majority of reconstruction has been, that has been undertaken has been done by Haitians. I can say that quite honestly. Um, there hasn't been a whole lot of reconstruction, but there has been, what has been there has been Haitians. You see people in construction, they're Haitians. Um, just to use examples, uh, we're, we're working with partners like Habitat for Humanity, I mentioned earlier, or Handicap International, to build about 7,000 transitional shelters. Uh, these are the one room structures with plywood walls that I mentioned earlier, and I think there was a picture of some of them under construction. If you looked at the workers, they're all Haitian. Uh, when we competitively bid this $50 million um, uh, contract, and we broke it up into five different contracts or five different partners, we said a requirement is to use local labor to teach them trades, whether it's carpentry um, or any other trade related to the construction of these uh, facilities. We're giving people skills. The question is, when the program ends, will there be other construction, whether it's funded by aid agencies or it's funded by a vibrant uh, economy? You know, it's great if you educate someone to be an engineer, but if there's no job, as we see in the Mideast where people have been highly educated but no jobs, they get unhappy. And that means you know, political instability or it can mean they, they emigrate to where there is opportunity and then you have a brain drain. So um, we're very much focused on edu uh, training and work and using uh, local labor. Um, we're not going to, our needs are you know, very community based. We're not gonna be training engineers. Um, you know, what I've heard the prime minister say is, um, we don't need engineers and doctors and, and lawyers. What we need are carpenters and IT people um, to uh, provide more of a uh, middle class than an upper class in Haiti. And I personally, I, I agree with that. So, thank you very much. Jump away, quick. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have a couple of little gifts for you. Um, Too Big to Fail from Andrew Ross Sorkin. He was our uh, annual dinner speaker earlier this year. Oh, really? And just off the, wherever they print these, our World Affairs Council mug, and we'll send that to you. Oh, well, so thank you very much. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Uh, a couple of things. Please put your ballots uh, in the ballot box up there. And again, we have um, some donation buckets up there if you'd like to donate to either one of these causes. Um, I'd like to thank uh, David Meltzer again for his very, very interesting talk today. 
Join us next week for Pirates on the High Seas with Captain Gordon Van Hook, now a Senior Director at Maersk Shipping Lines. We are adjourned.